Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today's special guest is a beloved actress, author, and animal welfare advocate who's been a major presence in the entertainment world since she was a contract player at Columbia Pictures <laughs> at the age of 16. She's appeared in 31 movies, including Die, Die, My Darling, McClintock, The Magnificent Seven Ride, Herbie Rides Again, Escape to Athena, Jump, The Artist's Wife, and many more. She's co-starred with great screen legends like John Wayne, Maureen O'Hara, Lana Turner, Ava Gardner, Bing Crosby, Sammy Davis Jr., and Glenn Ford. Her television career includes over 25 miniseries 200 guest starring appearances, 35 made for TV movies, and three TV series. Her first show, The Girl from Uncle, was the first hour long American TV series starring a woman in the leading role. She then went on to star in The Feather and Father Gang. But she's perhaps best remembered as Jennifer Hart on the blockbuster long running TV series, Heart to Heart for which she was nominated for two Emmy Awards and five Golden Globe Awards. She's appeared on stage in London's West End and throughout the country in many highly acclaimed productions, including How the Other Half Loves, View from the Bridge, Matador, On Golden Pond, The King and I, and of course, Love Letters, co-starring Robert Wagner in a hugely successful national tour for which she won the Sarah Siddons Award. She's written award-winning screenplays, and she recorded a wonderful CD with the legendary jazz artist Paige Kavanaugh called On the Same Page. And if that weren't enough, she's written three best-selling books, Stephanie Powers' Super Life, Powers' Pilates, Stephanie Powers' Guide to Longevity and Well-Being Through Pilates, and her poignant and compelling memoir, One from the Heart. She's a passionate lover of travel and speaks seven languages, including Kiswahili and Mandarin. But her greatest passion is her lifelong devotion to animal preservation and protection. She's the founder and president of the William Holden Wildlife Foundation, continuing the groundbreaking species conservation work and education programs in Kenya, honoring the legacy of her beloved longtime partner, mentor, and best friend, William Holden. She's intensely involved at a grassroots level with a number of zoos and wildlife organizations whose mission is to protect and preserve endangered species who are in great peril of extinction. And she's received dozens of international honors for her tireless commitment to this vitally important cause. It's my great honor to welcome the incomparable Stephanie Powers to our show. Stephanie, thank you so much for being here. Harvey, what an introduction, is that me? <laughs> That's you, along with your little friend, Papuka. You should write my biography. This is Papuka, Miss Papuka. Look at her. You see her? She's absolutely gorgeous. And I understand she's 50 years old. She's over 50, but she's been in my life. We've been together for 50 years. Imagine having that, having this extraordinary relationship for 50 years. She knows all my secrets and she, and she knows how to play me. Oh my goodness, does she I, ever. Well, I'm glad to have her with us. <laughs> I, I, I wanna start with a few questions about your amazing career before we talk about the incredibly important work you're doing in wildlife conservation. You were one of the very last stars to be put under contract to a major studio and you made 15 of your 31 movies while you were under contract. Did you like the studio system? Oh, well, it was a gift in those days. It was a tremendous gift because you had the whole studio at your disposal. You could learn how go to the editing department and learn how films were edited. You could go to the camera department and learn all about what lens saw what. And so that when you were standing in front of the lens and you asked what, what the cameraman, what lens he had on, you understood what it was seeing. And so little of that is accessible to actors today you, who, who are working in front of the film, of, of the camera and never really get a chance to see what uh, the camera sees. So, and, and, the, and of course in those days they had, 
They had costume designers under contract. They had makeup artists under contract. They had photographers. So you were constantly being photographed. You were constantly being fitted for different things. They built a whole body out of your body that they would they would start any any costumes would be started before you even had a had a fitting they'd already have been made on the body that they created they had uh, a whole they made a mask out of your face in so that there, there were any special makeup that was required for any particular character that they could practice with it on the on the cast on the plaster of paris cast they also had a uh, measured your head so that there was a head there with your hairline. So if they had to make wigs for you, I mean, it was a factory. It was an incredible movie making factory, but it was also a movie making family. Everybody knew everybody. Everybody grew up together. Their kids went into the business. Their uncles, aunts or whatever were in the business. And this prevailed all over the city because it was a very small town. I could go to any studio and I would know people in the crew. I'd walk on a set and they'd say, hey, Deb, hi, how are you doing? You know, it was, it was a very small, small family. Today, and with the advent of tape and video and, and all of that, anybody can make a, a, a film with their phone. So it's no longer that kind of an industry. You don't really feel that you belong to an industry that had that structure and you were a part of it. When I got my Screen Actors Guild card, SAG, oh my God, that was a, that was a great honor to be in the Screen Actors Guild. My goodness, it was created by actors, for actors, run by actors to protect wages and working conditions for us. Now I'm on the board of the Screen Actors Guild, AFTRA, which is a very different kind of an organization, including many, many different kinds of professions. So it's diffused all of the focus on what it meant to be a part of the industry. It was a privilege. You knew that you were coming in at an entry level. You were a nobody. You knew you were a nobody, but you hoped that you would earn the right to play in that fabulous playground of the gods, which was to work with all these established people who you knew. You knew who everybody was. You knew the names of the people who started the industry. You knew the names of the, if you didn't, you'd be totally embarrassed today. <laughs> if it didn't happen 10 minutes ago, nobody knows any, what anybody did. Well, I was intrigued by something you wrote in your book about your time as a young actress in Hollywood. You were making three films a year for five years. And although your films were successful, you said that you didn't feel like a Hollywood insider. You didn't socialize with your fellow actors and live the Hollywood party lifestyle. You felt like you were on the outside looking in. Why? Well, it wasn't my, my thing. You know, I just didn't. I, I knew a lot of people. I was I participated on a softball team, which was uh, peopled by a bunch of uh, girls, uh, my contemporaries and, and slightly older. Kathy Green, who was the daughter of uh, Johnny Green, the great conductor, composer for films and, and uh, symphonies. We play, I was third base and she was center field so we were a great team and we were these sort of tomboys who uh, were among all these beautiful girls and so we had a lot of fun with the boys and all that but I I was kind of interested in all the things the boys were doing I wasn't interested in the, I liked riding horses and driving fast cars now, one of my favorites of all your movies is Die, Die, My Darling, starring Tallulah Bankhead. And in 2013, you got to actually portray Tallulah Bankhead in a play called Looped. What was that like? Oh, dear. Well, this is a long story. Have you got a minute? <laughs> <laughs> sure. So the, I was under contract to Columbia. They sent me to England to do a film called 
Die, Die, My Darling. In the beginning, it was called The Fanatic. And for a long time, it was billed as The Fanatic in Europe. And then in the United States, it was called Die, Die, My Darling because Tallulah was so known for saying, darling, darling, all the time to everybody. And I suppose she's the one who coined the, the phrase because it became the sort of thing that, that uh, um, actors were known to do is to call each other, call everybody darling. But she's the one who started it. So, of course, I knew who Tallulah was in spite, in spite of the fact that she was of a completely different generation, my God, going many generations ahead of me. She was a great theatrical actress. She was famous for her radio programs, and she was a famous raconteur. It was very well known that uh, Tennessee Williams wrote Streetcar Named Desire for her, and she had famously turned it down. This extraordinary gift to the theater, this magnificent piece of work. So she was very well known for her, the nature of, of her, her character. Flamboyant and uh, rapier-like wit, but wit indeed. She was also famous for never wearing underwear, but that was, you know, that was also her scandalous side. So I'd heard about all of these things because everybody talked about the scandalous Tallulah Bankhead. Uh, I was 19 or 20 when I did that. So my mother was with me because 21 was the legal age and I could, was not supposed to travel out of the country without a parent or a guardian. So my mother came to London during the filming. And of course, Tallulah loved my, my mother, loved her. But we, we, we got off to a very rough start because Tallulah was extremely nervous. This was the first film she had done in 20 years. The last, the previous film that she had done was called Lifeboat, directed by Alfred Hitchcock, a famous movie. And there he was, she used to, <laughs> she used to shock everybody for not wearing underwear and uh, was climbing up and down ladders and everything, <laughs> shocking everybody. She would say, I'm a natural blonde and I'm here to prove it. <laughs> so when we did this movie, she arrived in England, not having been there for 20 years. And the last time she had been there and her greatest success, the, the, the start of her career, the, the theatrical performance that made her career happened in London. So she'd always had this uh, tremendous connection with English theater and, and emotionally for herself. The, the whole idea of being in England recalled all of her great uh, successes. So she lived at the time when she was a, a successful young uh, West End star. She lived at the, the Ritz Hotel, which in those days was the number one hotel in London. It was the Ritz. You stayed at the Ritz. So that, but when we were doing this, it was in the 1960s and the Ritz had fallen on hard times. Its ownership had transferred and, and some of the maintenance wasn't as good as it had been and certainly not what it is today because it's magnificent once again in all its former glory. But in those days, it was not very well maintained and she tripped walking up the stairs into the entrance to the lobby and fell backwards. Well, unfortunately, some paparazzi were there and they captured her falling backwards and landing on her derriere. And they published the photographs on the front page of the Daily Mail mm -hmm. saying the Lula's triumphant return as she is on her bum on the sidewalk, which immediately gave her a trauma and she went to her bed. Oh, she went to her bed, lost her voice. It, it was uh, disastrous. She lost all her confidence and it looked very dodgy for the movie because she was to have 
all of her uh, wardrobe and every, all her fittings, etc. And then we were going to do what we now call a table read, which is to read the script with the actors prior to filming so that everybody is well aware of uh, their roles and each other and how each sound. And it's very helpful. It's a very efficient way of filming. And everything I've ever had anything to do with producing, we've always started that way because it really helps move along the filming process. And she arrived getting out of the limousine in a ankle length fur coat, being helped by two young men on either side of her as she is guided into the rehearsal room and saying, oh, darling, hello, darling, darling, oh, it's wonderful, 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 Stephen, wonderful, oh, oh, God, and that was it. And other people read her lines, and we all read it, and then at the end, she applauded and said, wonderful, 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 wonderful. <laughs> and then, so the director, Silvio Narizana, was very clever. He designed the first few days of filming in such a way that Tallulah wouldn't have to do very much. She could be called late, not early in the morning, get her hair and makeup done, break for lunch, be in the first shot after lunch, and then go home. And all of whatever they filmed of Tallulah in those first three days were long shots from a distance, waving out of a window or walking to and from, making entrances and exits, so that there was nothing, she didn't have to speak, she didn't have to act, she just had to move about. The fourth day at lunchtime, the whole company went to the local studio that was nearby, we were shooting in a place called Denim, Denim, and, and there were Denim Studios. So we went to see the previous day's work in called Rushes, and we saw the uncut film. We just saw take after take after take, and, and Tallulah had to sit through everybody else's work until they saw one shot of Tallulah waving or walking in and out. And after sitting through the whole of everybody else's work, the following day when Tallulah showed up, she didn't have, she regained her voice, she regained her confidence, and she regained her fight. So she was ready to work. She was ready to roll. And she became this extraordinary person once again we shared when we were filming back at the studio uh, on a set the 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 old studios in England used to have the the dressing rooms built into the sound stage so they weren't outside of the sound stage they were actually part of the sound stage and Tallulah's dressing room was right next door to mine and uh, she never liked to call her cast members by their real name. She tried to call them only by their, by their character name so that she wouldn't forget their character name when she was on stage or in film. So she would pound on the wall and say, Patricia, no, I going to Patricia. I was always Patricia. Forever and ever and ever, when I would call her in New York, I'd hear the phone would be picked up by her housekeeper. I would say, oh, hello, uh, Willie May. Hey, can you ask Miss Bankhead if she'll accept my call? And I would hear, oh, yes, Miss Bowers. Mm -hmm. So she called, I'd hear her saying, oh, Miss Bankhead, is Stephanie Powers on the phone? And she would say, oh, no, 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 no. you'd hear this shouting in the background. The phone would uh, get delivered to her and she'd get on the phone and she'd say, Patricia, darling. <laughs> <laughs> but you had to play her on the stage. That must have been a riot. Well, it was a very interesting process. The play had been first offered to me because it's about an actual incident that while it didn't occur in California, it occurred in New York, the basic incident was pretty much the same. It was one line 
of dialogue that Tallulah, that was unclear on the film. And Tallulah had to go into what we call a dubbing room to put her voice over the film so that the, that the dialogue could be heard. She arrived something like four hours late to the session, the recording session. She was uh, overserved, shall we say. She had been drinking all day. And so the entire process took about 24 hours to get this one line of dialogue. And that's what the play is about. And there's another character in the play. And when I read it, in the beginning, I said to the, the writer, director, producer, I said, well, you, you want to know my feelings. I think the dialogue for Tallulah is, is wonderful. It's wonderful. And, and, and you captured her sense of humor and all of that. The problem is that the play isn't about anything. So other than, you know, doing uh, an imitation of Tallulah, don't you think there's a missed opportunity here with the other character to make the play about something so that the characters have a resolution? And uh, he didn't care for my opinion. Mm -hmm. And so he passed on me and I passed on him. And he offered it to Valerie Harper. And Valerie called me because we were friends. And she said, why did you turn it down? And I told her uh, the same thing I told him. And she said, yes, I know, but we'll, we're, we think we can fix it on the road. And, and so I'm going to give it a try. I said, well, go girl, you know, you'll have a, a wonderful time becoming Tallulah because she was, uh, she was a great character. And Valerie did the play successfully on the road, but there were the critiques for the play were never very good. They were always good for her. And when they got to Broadway, the play was scathed, it was absolutely eviscerated. And, but she got nominated for an Emmy, for a, for a Tony. And, and the play only lasted a few weeks. So one of the evenings I went to see the play before it closed, and Valerie and I went to, and her husband went to have dinner afterward. And I had said, listen, you're going to, you can take this on the road. You can make, uh, you know, whatever you want. You can make a tour that you two produce and, and put it on because it wasn't that expensive to mount. And she said, yes, we're thinking about doing that uh, for next year. Great. So fade out, fade in. Next year comes. And I was in the Middle East doing a play reading and I get a phone call from Valerie. Now Valerie and I became friends because both of us had had the same kind of cancer, went to the same doctor, had the exact same surgery in the same hospital four days apart. So we, we became friends kind of uh, sisters through cancer mm -hmm. and we would see each other at our rehabs and our, our checks and all of this. And uh, so the phone call from Valerie was a little bit of a surprise, but she immediately delivered uh, the bad news. And the bad news was that her cancer had spread mm. and it had gone to the brain. And of course, you know, I was devastated, but oh. here's the problem. We've invested a lot of money in uh, doing a tour of Looped for five cities that we're going to, that if we don't do it, we, we stand to lose a tremendous amount of money. Would you take it over? Well, I said yes before thinking at all about scheduling. And by the time I finished the commitment that I was doing and arrived in New York, I had eight days rehearsal before we opened <laughs> in Florida. So it was a good thing I had known Tallulah because uh, there were many times when Tallulah kind of uh, came through and, and covered a lot of my mistakes. <laughs> That's what you call karma. 
when you were under contract to Columbia Pictures, you weren't allowed to do television. And in fact, MGM had to buy out your contract with Columbia so that you could do The Girl from UNCLE. Was that a scary decision for you to go into television? Well, I had no choice, <laughs> did I? Uh, Columbia owned me and they sold my contract to MGM. You know, it was another job, another experience. And so uh, I had no idea what I was in getting into. Well, it was the best thing that could have happened. And there was a, a kind of high camp quality to the girl from uncle. In one scene, you were popped out of a giant toaster and Boris <laughs> Karloff appeared in drag. Why did the writers make the show so much less serious than the man from uncle? Well, we had a... Uh, a showrunner who was also a writer who had a great sense of humor. And he was, you know, there was there was so much pop art going on. Carnaby Street was happening, all the all that Monty Python sort of humor. And and of course, all the everything was English. Everything was coming across the Atlantic from England, fashion, uh, music, all the trends. And he thought, well, we'll just have a sense of humor. <laughs> and so he had these preposterous storylines. And the network, NBC, kept saying, oh, you've got to tell Powers and, and, and Harrison. It was, a, it was Noel Harrison who was my companion in this. I, I think I had a little bit to do with getting Noel the job because I had seen Noel perform and I so desperately wanted to have him uh, on board and it worked out and he was wonderful. So they would kept saying, you know, you really, really have to tell Harrison and Powers, they've got to be more serious. I mean, look at Vaughn and, you know, look at the man from Uncle. They're serious. And so but we were getting popped out of toasters and, uh, and worse things than that. The great thing, though, that happened, sadly, many for many of the character actors in Hollywood, when the studio system fell apart, a lot of their contracts were dropped as well. And so it became possible for all of these extraordinary actors to come and do television. And in our case, we had a plethora of the most divine people able to come and do our show. We had Anne Southern, we had Peggy Lee, can you imagine, as guest stars? And on and on and on, and of course, Boris Karloff famously in drag. <laughs> it was an amazing show. In 1984, you wrote and starred in a wonderful TV movie called Family Secrets, co-starring Maureen Stapleton and Melissa Gilbert about three generations of women who spend an emotional weekend that changes them forever. What inspired you to write that story? You know, I had always thought about the interesting dynamic be between women in a family mothers, daughters, granddaughters, how that all worked out, especially when there was the, the most important man in that dynamic was, was the, the grandfather or father. So it was Maureen Stapleton played my mother. I was in the middle and, and my daughter was played by Melissa Gilbert. My father had died he was a professor at a university in Madison, Wisconsin. We lived in, my daughter and I lived in Chicago. We drove up to Madison to help my mother disassemble the house that she was selling, the family house. So in disassembling the house, all of the issues, the emotional issues that were never dealt with, in a family came out as the house was come, was being disassembled. It brought up things that were never talked about because in certain families that were rather constipated about their emotions, no one ever spoke. And I thought it was just an interesting 
aspect of certain kinds of, a, of it, nothing to do with my family, but certainly to do with uh, others that I had seen or read about. Yeah, it was a, just a tremendous script. And in 1987, you starred in a miniseries based on a true story called At Mother's Request, in which you played Frances Schroeder, who basically forced her 17-year-old son into killing her father. That was a very, very chilling performance. And I'm just wondering, Stephanie, how did you prepare for the role? Did you go and see her in jail? Uh, everything but. <laughs> everything but. Her son, the one that was in jail, you know, there, it was very strange to be working in, uh, in Salt Lake City. My, as I opened the, the, the drew the, the, the drapes in my hotel room, I overlooked where the garage was of the that was owned by the father and where the murder had taken place. The same judge that arraigned her was we used in the in the film, the same lawyer, the same, the same policewoman that booked her. Wow. So uh, I had done some research about her in New York because she lived in a building near Gracie Mansions that a friend of mine lived in. And there were documentaries, there was an interview of her. I watched the way she held a cigarette, I watched the way she moved. And I, uh, this was a, an, an, an incredible, an incredibly troubled woman who was very much alive and incarcerated when we went to Utah to film um, that part of the of the series, of the miniseries. Her son that was not convicted was constantly calling the production office saying, do you want to rent my car? I have the same car. Oh yeah, he was trying to get on the set all the time. The boy that was in jail for having done the murder he wanted to talk. Do you want to talk to me? Do you want to? Um, all these messages were coming back and forth because they wanted to be, they wanted to be recognized. It was wow. a very, very unusual experience, I must say. Oh, and it's a, it's a terrific movie. You know, Stephanie, when I look at your career, it's amazing how much destiny has had a role to play. For example, if there had not been a newspaper strike in New York, you would have been on Broadway doing Cyrano de Bergerac. You would not have had the chance to be in Heart to Heart, correct? That's right. It was the, it was the happiest newspaper strike uh, I've ever known. Well, you wrote in your book that your dear mom was a great believer in the saying, when one door closes, another one opens. That's really been true for you throughout your life, hasn't it? Well, it's a way of looking at things that sort of helps you survive a lot of blows and disappointments. And indeed, you know, we never know what's going to happen. So that's always a, a better way to look at things than going into the past. It's rather pointless to, to carry it as baggage. When your dear friend Robert Wagner was on our show, he said that although Heart to Heart had great writing and great acting, the real reason for the success of the show was the unique chemistry between the two of you, which he first noticed when you guest starred on his first show, It Takes a Thief. Did you also feel that chemistry right from the beginning? Oh, yes, because, you know, he's... he's uh... Well, I spoke with him. I have to tell you that I spoke with him this morning. He sends you his regards. Oh, and thank he wants you. to know how this goes. And he said you're one of his favorite interviewers. Just oh. uh, to, to give you a little uh, kudos. and uh, Thank a little, you. A little lovely gift from RJ, whom we love and adore. Uh, there was this instantaneous feeling of trust. And I think that's a great thing that, a, that a, is a gift that a, one actor can give to another actor is a feeling that you can go anywhere with them and they'll be there with you. It's the ultimate tennis game where you know they're going to hit the ball back and, and not try to cremate you, you know, there. And I think with everybody who's ever worked with RJ, I think they would say the same thing that you can trust him. And that's a, that's a very rare thing. 
Your on-screen chemistry with RJ also translated to the stage when you co-starred with him in the West End and on the national tour of Love Letters, which I got to see in Toronto in 1983, I must tell you. The, oh, did you? the two of you did over 500 performances of that show. Isn't that right? Yeah. Yes. It's just and amazing. we did it in Australia. We did it in, in England. We did it in Canada, as you know. My goodness. And, and, and all over the country, all over the United States. Now, as you know, Heart to Heart was so popular that after its five season run, you and RJ did eight made for TV movies. And there's been talk for years of doing a remake, but with a gay couple. At one point, it looked like Alan Cumming was going to star in it. But for so far, nothing's happened. Would you like to see a remake of the show, Stephanie? Uh, no. No, I, uh, first of all, I mean, it was, it was a certain time period. It was a time period where fashion was different. The sort of... Uh, Sophistication. I guess you could say that, yes. There, and it, it's the repartee. It's the... Uh, it wasn't a kitchen sink. That was RJ's his, uh, criticism in any of the, the, the script draft meetings that we would have. Was when people would start to write a script or start to uh, explore an idea where... We had an argument, we had a, a breakup, or we had a this, or what have you, or, or we don't have a child. We couldn't do what we did if we had a child. We couldn't, RJ didn't, was always explaining that this wasn't a kitchen sink drama. This was, this was the fantasy relationship you, that everybody always dreamed of. Whether they still dream of that relationship or not, I don't know. Life is very different now, and and people communicate or don't communicate uh, in the same way. And there was a certain naivete that allowed those two characters to exist that I don't think is in our lexicon today. So to try and recreate something you know, there, there are too many recreations of, of the same theme. We've got to have some original ideas. And if there's going to be a gay couple, we'll put them in a different set of circumstances or, uh, I mean, make it a situation comedy, whatever. But it doesn't have to be a duplicate of something that already was made. Move on. I think you're right. I think, you know, there's such enduring love for the two of you in that role. I mean, in 2008, you and RJ did a special edition of Heart to Heart for the Graham Norton show in England. And I mean, it looked like you were having so much fun. Everyone still loves that show, but with the two of you in those roles. So I agree with you. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. You know, I think that, that the, the, the best way, is, he, he's like the, uh, the, the, the wicked evil brother, you know, <laughs> big brother, you know, he definitely pushes all my buttons. You should see the, the outtake reel of what the, what the shenanigans he was up to uh, all the time. So we, we, we've had a, my gosh, uh, there's no way we could bottle this chemistry. And there was no way we could predict that it would be to the extent that it was. We still make each other laugh, thank God. And uh, I adore him. I absolutely adore him too. And I've adored you my whole life. So this is quite an honor, let me tell you. I have to ask you about A Shadow on the Sun. You played the pilot, Beryl Markham. She's the first woman to fly solo nonstop across the Atlantic. Was that one of your favorite roles? Is the first person to fly solo going west across the Atlantic. Lindbergh did it east going with a tailwind. He said it couldn't be done to the west because you'd have a headwind and you couldn't carry enough fuel. You'd be a bomb. Well, she did it. She did it. And you did it on the and screen. I've always admired her because she, she grew up in Kenya. 
where I spend uh, a great deal of my life. She, uh, an awful lot of the people I knew knew her and had known her over the years, uh, including one of her old lovers was lived in the area where I live. And I, I, I met her sort of one night when I had flown in with a, with a friend of mine into Nairobi and uh, he was a pilot and I was, a, uh, I, I, I had, uh, I got my uh, pilot's license very young at Santa Monica Flyers, but I was, I would never fly without a pilot in the next seat because I'm, I just don't, don't fly that much and it's too dangerous. So I was driving into Nairobi. We, he said, you want to be Beryl? I'm going to stop by. And I had to pass the race course where Beryl lived uh, in a cottage. And uh, he was going to bring her a bottle of vodka, which was uh, her favorite drink. So I drove by there with him. And um, I sort of saw her through the door. But she was in the latter part of her life. She wasn't so keen on meeting any new people, especially women. <laughs> men, she loved men. She loved men and she loved men who were pilots. And so she could have a drink with my friend and talk about flying and, and everything else. Horses flying, all of that. But her story was fascinating. And and in depth, and it was not uh, exactly the story that was covered in the book called West with the Night. West with the Night was rediscovered by a man in San Francisco who somehow got the rights and, and published it. And it became a big success. It was a bestseller in the New York Times. And suddenly people became aware of Beryl Markham. And then... It came out at a later date that the story was kind of embellished, shall we say, it wasn't quite told in, in, with accuracy because she, at the time she wrote the book, she was married to a screenwriter who was a heavily alcoholic and had written a bunch of Tarzan movies and all sorts of things and fancied himself a very elevated writer and so he polished her book and in so doing put his twist on a lot of the stories but the stories were hers but the circumstances were not quite accurate when this book was a success there was a, a writer from Vanity Fair who went out to uh, interview her this is before she fell and, and wound up in the hospital, which was the spiral, downward spiral that eventually she died from. And his, it was his interview that we used as our source material, plus all of the stories that I gathered from people who knew her and had lived their lives throughout. They went to school with her when she was a child. And it's a very small group of people, a small, small society in... Uh, in Kenya. Well, it's just a beautiful oh, performance. Oh, now, thank you. This was another one of those unfortunate instances where the network did not know how to publicize it because, first of all, I didn't look like me. I didn't look like Jennifer Hart. They didn't know how to explain that, and they didn't know, and I didn't speak like Jennifer Hart. I tried to speak as she would have spoken, and and tried to portray her uh, as well as I could, authentically, which uh, was not what the what uh, CBS was used to, and so they they dropped the ball on on publicizing it, using my image that didn't look like Jennifer Hart. They didn't say Stephanie Powers as Beryl Markham, the aviatrix, they just said Beryl Markham. So they didn't, they didn't use any of my following from, uh, and it didn't get good ratings. However, the people that put up the deficit financing was uh, London Weekend Television. 
they had ratings that went through the roof. Because well, understandably, it was an amazing performance. But thank you. But they also knew who she was. And the Americans didn't know who she was. So the, the name of Beryl Markham meant nothing to them. Now, you were part of a very prestigious group of people in the industry who testified before the FCC in Washington <laughs> to convince them to authorize the creation of cable networks. So, Stephanie, when you look at the world of television today, the competition shows, the reality shows, the big budget miniseries, the 24-hour news networks, the hundreds of channels and streaming platforms, do you like what you see? Well, it wasn't what we thought. <laughs> what we were trying to do was to offer more employment and a greater variety of choices of programming than was being offered by the, the three networks that control the airwaves. That was CBS, NBC, and ABC. And it didn't happen right away. Everybody that went there to to support the idea of opening up greater choice for a viewing audience by offering cable, what was then called family choice television. We thought it would be a good thing. In fact, I, I think in some ways it is offering a greater choice because the networks have once again disappointed. Their programming is not as interesting as the programming that you can find on whichever streaming channel that you, you subscribe to. I think some very good work is being done on those streaming channels. Some very bad work is also being done. But just to fill up the, uh, the, the titles so that you have all these choices and not a lot of good ones. But when they're good, they're very good. And there are lots that are very, very good. Some really good work being done. And once in a while on network television, one sneaks through. But it's a shame that it's not very often. And uh, I personally would hope that, that if, the, the, if that's a reflection of the taste of the American public, then maybe we could offer the American public of something a little bit better to raise their, ta their taste level. Yeah, I but agree. You know, the, the Hollywood that you grew up in was a small town with movie studios run by movie moguls. And now the studios are run by large corporate conglomerates and decisions are made by committee. And there's public testing and product placement everywhere. Are you glad you're no longer fully immersed in that world? I'm glad that I had it. I'm glad I had, I, I knew what the movie industry was how it was meant to be as the creators meant it to be. What it's become now is a business, uh, not necessarily a business that's run by creative people, a business that's run by the bottom line, as most businesses are. But then of course, also the population of the world and the population of the United States has since I was a, a, a youth going under contract, it's probably trebled, if not quadrupled. So is it the natural course that corporations are going to take over everything we do? Unfortunately, it seems that way. And if you are a reader of science fiction, as I am, a devotee of science fiction, going back to all of the great science fiction writers of the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, Everybody predicted that this would happen. And everybody predicted the negative aspects of what the result of this would be. The dehumanizing aspect of it, the robotic aspect of it, the fact that we're all gonna be put in little slots, little cookie cutters, da, 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 and that uh, creeping socialism is going to make us all into numbers and creeping, robotization of all of the the previous jobs that are, that were that were done by human beings uh, is going to make us less capable and so are we going to have as uh, 
a 1984 situation where we're all going to be in numbers and we're all going to be, our frustrations are going to be taken care of by the corporation that runs the world that is going to give us nice little uh, drugs to keep us high and happy. I don't know, but I, I think it's a dangerous time. I don't think we should be lulled to sleep by all of these things that are allegedly making our lives easy. It's also taking away our imagination. It's taking away our capabilities. It's taking away our self-determination. And our individuality. A tremendous lack of individuality. So when you say uh, a redo of Heart to Heart, you go, we're always talking about remakes. We're talking about prequels, that wonderful word. Because where's the original creativity? Has it all been taken away from us because everybody grew up with, with video games where it was all done for you? Or tablets that were stuck in front of babies in order to be uh, babysitters? So it robbed their brains of invention? I don't know, maybe it has. But I, I worry about things like that. And I worry that that while everybody is concerned about the environment and would like to be to say, oh, yes, I, I eat organic food, so therefore I must be doing something for the environment. I recycle my trash. Yes, it's good, but that's not doing anything. And because uh, are we becoming so Im immune to self-participation? to committing to actually do something and make it happen, get your fingernails dirty, cut off those long uh, Kardashian fingernails and do something with your life. Well, get that dirty. leads me to my next line of questioning, which is all about the incredibly important work you are doing for animal protection. I know you were involved in animal protection even before you met William Holden because you grew up on your stepfather's farm and as a young woman, you rescued a baby Malaysian sun bear from a pet shop in West Hollywood. You yeah. see, I did my homework. You but certainly did. You certainly did. Is it fair to say that William Holden was the one who sensitized you to the issue of animal preservation and conservation? No, he didn't sensitize me. He, he exposed me to East Africa because that, uh, I was involved. Yes, my stepfather bred racehorses and collected exotic animals. So when I rescued that, uh, that bear from a pet shop, I had been very well trained by my stepfather to look at the lives of animals as something that is a responsibility if you take them on from cradle to grave. And uh, otherwise, the, what could happen to them would be fates worse than, and the most horrible fates, or worse than death. So when I was a child, because he believed in tough love, and all I wanted to do, have a horse, have a horse, have a horse, he took me to a slaughterhouse. I didn't see anything being, I didn't hear or see anything being killed, but I saw the law, the, uh, the, the containment areas where they were all being kept and fed, fattened up to go in and be slaughtered. Horses of all shapes and sizes and the ages. And I thought, you know, young ones, old ones, beautiful ones and standing there with their heads down because they seemed to know. And he said, if you don't accept the responsibility this is where they could wind up. That really imbued me with the responsibility to our fellow species because everything that fell out of a tree anyway was brought to my house so that we, we were always taking care of birds that fell from nests or, so it was, it was always an animal friendly house. And, and uh, that commitment uh, stayed with me. So when Bill and I, when Bill, I'd been to North Africa and, and uh, I hadn't been to East Africa. And, and of course, Bill's involvement in Kenya was so uh, extraordinarily advanced in his thinking about wildlife conservation because no one was thinking, had even those words in their vocabulary. 
until way later in the 1970s, although extinction had been discussed in the 1950s by a lot of scientists who were talking about a pollution and the greenhouse effect, whether it was Buckminster Fuller in the 30s and 40s and the, the wonderful books that were published. The scientists were called eggheads and they were vilified for their suggestion that there might be pollution of the ocean one day if we weren't capable, if we weren't uh, careful. We now know that to be a fact. And yet in those days, people were so hard headed that they couldn't understand that their own actions were producing this horrible side effect, which we are now living with. We make our choices with our pocketbook. Irresponsible as they are in many cases, young women who keep buying clothes that they throw away that are made out of fabrics that contain polyesters that will never biodegrade, never, but they just throw them out. And yet they say, oh yes, I'm a conservationist because it sounds good. We have to take seriously this because we're dying and the planet is dying. There is no question about it. We have too much evidence to prove it. We've denuded the planet to such an extent that there is no more ability for the green belt to absorb the carbon dioxide that we're producing. We've cut down so much green, so much forest, so much vegetation, and our farming, our commercial farming is monocrop that is now measurable for, for by, in space when it's harvested. The amount of heat that's produced during the harvest period of all of the factory farms in the Northern Hemisphere, raising the temperature of the planet by the CO2 that is being released once the ground is open and tilled and more released and nothing is covered. And once, it's come, once the greenery starts to, to appear to cover the, the ground, which is only it's dirt, it's not soil, because it's only growing because of chemicals, because it's an inert object that has to have chemicals poured into it in order to plant things that will grow because there's no natural nutrition. There's no biodiversity in the soil. There is no soil. Once the greenery grows over it, from space they measure it, the temperature drops. But just about the time that the temperature is affected by the regrowth of vegetation, they're harvesting in the Southern Hemisphere. So we're not giving the planet a break at all. One of the things that we're doing, one of the things the William Holden Wildlife Foundation does, it's wildlife education, wildlife preservation through education and alternatives to habitat destruction through demonstrations of a variety of ways in which that can be accomplished. Soil restoration and regeneration has become a big part of it because we're in a five year drought that is so treacherous that the desert, it's called desertification. That's a new word that we should all learn because it's got to be in our vocabulary. The desert zones are growing when the ground turns into desert, it's sand. Can it be regenerated? Yes, and it has. The Israelis have been doing it for years. They're doing it in Saudi Arabia. They're doing it all over the Middle East where they, are re, they, are, they have taken seawater and turned it into, into potable water and they're irrigating. California has the largest coastline in the United States. We have one desalinization plant, one. And we cannot water our lawns. We cannot, our, our agriculture is suffering, which is one of our main sources of income because we are not desalinizing. We're not using what the ocean is giving us. And the environmentalists will hate me because they're all screaming that it's going to, yes, but there are ways to put, to to locate desalinization plants that will revitalize other areas 
of dead ocean floor. If you had sections of revitalization going on and sections of reclaiming water from desalinization, you could be servicing both ends of it. Well, I where wanna... is this leadership coming from? It's not coming from Sacramento. It's not coming from the damn politicians. I'm sorry. It's not. It has to come from people. So private enterprise has to start trying to participate and human beings have to start participating on their own. Well, one of the things change. you've done through the William Holden Wildlife Foundation, it complements the conservation work being done at the ranch and provides education in biodiversity, species conservation, and alternatives to habitat destruction. Stephanie, tell us why education is such an important part of the work you're doing. Well, education is, is, is an important part of everything. Look at what's happened to the abysmal education we have in, this, in, in the United States. We're becoming dumber, we're not becoming smarter. The bar is lower. In, less, in the city of Los Angeles, which is the second largest city school system in the country, I think we're like uh, 23rd from the bottom of the, of, the, uh, of the standard of education. We learn nothing about history. If we try to tell people with, who are trying to feed their families and, and who, are, who are starving, that you mustn't shoot that animal, you mustn't cut down that tree and then walk away, we, without telling them what the purpose of that tree is, how that tree gives you the life that allows you to live, how that animal contributes to the environment. If you don't use education and altern offering alternatives while educating what are the component parts of life so that when you suggest a different way to farm, you've already told them what creates life in the soil that their parents used to, and their grandparents used to get food from, that they've destroyed. Now they understand because they've reached a point, the horrors are that they've reached a point where there are no alternatives. Now they want alternatives. And we start with small plot farmers who really aren't the farmers of the farms that we all used to think farmers were, they just pour a lot of chemicals on dirt, put the seeds in, wait for the rain to come, and something grows. But the chemicals are neat that you need to grow, it's, it's like a, a law of diminishing return. You need more and more and more chemicals to grow more and more and more. And eventually the, the soil gets burnt out from overuse of chemicals. So that soil, they move on into a habitat that should be shared by biodiversity, by wildlife, by birds, bees, all of the, the, the vital life sources that help agriculture to exist. Without the bees, we can't have agriculture, we can't have cross-pollination. Birds, bees, when you eliminate those. When was the last time you drove a car at night through the countryside and realized that there are no bugs on your windscreen. All the time. Okay. Doesn't that say something? When I was a kid, we were cleaning off the, the windscreen all the time at night. Well, the thing that amazes me about you, you know, you started this foundation, you created a registered charity, and then you had to become an expert fundraiser. How did you learn how to do that? Uh, a lot of people helped me. I got an awful lot of wonderful advice from people who were involved in, in fundraising, people who were in the corporate world, people who were educators in um, institutions where they, they, they helped me understand the importance of creating a, um, uh, a portfolio for some of the funds to be able to be invested. And, and underwrite all of the, uh, the, the work of the education center. They helped me understand how to do it and uh, how to uh, 
enter into this very rarefied atmosphere because there are people making a profession out of fundraising. They get paid a lot of money. Uh, I don't approve of that necessarily because, because I think the donors don't understand how much the person asking them for money sometimes gets paid. Uh, if they did, if, if they were clearer about it, then I would, wouldn't uh, object. But uh, so many of the organizations really never tell their donors um, exactly how much of their donation goes to the work that they're giving it for. I can stay here and talk about this for hours, but I can shortcut it by assuring you that I take care of all the overheads of the, of the foundation personally. Yes, I know that. It's and quite so remarkable. every dime that anybody gives me, 100% of it goes to the work. Nobody pays for my airplane ticket. Nobody pays for my house in Kenya. Nobody pays for my car or my gasoline or anything. It goes right to the work. When um, you look at the personal satisfaction you got from your show business career, how does it compare to the satisfaction you get from the work you're doing in the field of wildlife preservation? Well, there's so much work to do. I don't have time to be satisfied. <laughs> so wow. not necessarily satisfied. It's always challenging and you have to keep reinventing everything and you have to keep finding uh, solutions and solving problems and uh, hoping that you can uh, unite people uh, with the same thought process. Well, I hope you know there's a lot of love around you. You know, there's only one more thing I want to say to you, Stephanie. But first, I want to read you a poem that you wrote for Bill Holden when you fell in love with him in Hong Kong. Ooh, oh, where did you get that? <laughs> a, whis a whisper speaks as clouds descend on Asian peaks. You're everywhere making round my square. You've softened the edge that once was there. Stephanie, I, I just want you to know that the way you describe the impact of love in that poem is very moving. And it says a lot about what it means to you to be in a profoundly loving relationship. And I want to thank you for sharing that love with all of us. Well, thank you. Oof, I, 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 you, you, you got me with that one. <laughs> I hadn't thought about that in a long time. I think about it a lot. I want to tell our viewers that you can learn more about Stephanie Powers by going to her official website, stephaniepowersonline.com. And I urge you to learn more about the William Holden Wildlife Foundation by going to the website whwf.org. And please consider giving a donation in any amount to this organization that is doing so much to ensure the protection and preservation of endangered species. I want everyone to know that 100% of every dollar that's donated goes directly to the work being done in Kenya. Nothing is kept for overhead expenses in the United States, which are paid for privately. Well, Miss Stephanie Powers, it's been a great honor having you on our show. Harvey, you are as much of a delight as RJ said you were. And I will give him your regards. And he wants me to call and tell him exactly how this interview went. So I will do that. Thank you very much. And thank you for being a, good, a great supporter of our work in Kenya. Well, I've enjoyed your work tremendously over the years. I want to thank you for the immensely important work you're doing for animals, for the environment. Thank you so much for giving me this interview. Well, I thank you and Papuka thanks you. Thank you, Papuka. My dogs, thank you. <laughs> our guest has been one of my heroes, the fabulous Stephanie Powers. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to our producer, Steve Silver. Thank you to my dear friends, Robert Wagner and Catherine Cermak. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.